Hi, I'm Ron Landis. Welcome to my studio. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. Uh, today we're going to be uh, discussing a little bit about the um, tool steel we're using for the picks and a little bit about how we harden and temper and getting ready for striking. Um, we use several different types of steel depending on what the project is. Uh, for the picks, um, and maybe a little insight from Ron uh, uh, here would be helpful, um, but he uses an O1 steel in this case, which is an oil hardening steel. Um, for coining, my preference uh, is an S7 uh, for, for different reasons. Um, it's actually the hardening and tempering and machining and everything, um, because that's my end of the work. That's where I prefer uh, to use the S7. It would be interesting to, uh, to maybe have Ron's take on why he chooses O1. What we have here is the master die for our uh, next line of finger picks, which is going to be able to introduce uh, to the players um, a, a more affordable, a more economic alternative to our completely hand fabricated ones. Um, this has been uh, hubbed and carved and worked um, in several different variations to get to this piece. Uh, and this will be the piece that we harden, temper, and then use to create the working die, which is going to be the die that actually impresses the image and the, the, the teeth uh, into the piece um, that will actually create the final product for our users. So real quick, we're gonna discuss uh, some of the basic tools and materials we're gonna to use to get this through the hardening process. Uh, for this process, we're going to be using um, a stainless steel foil heat treating tool wrap. There, I read it for you. And uh, what this is going to do is, is we're going to put this, basically create a bag uh, to encase this in while it goes through the furnace. Um, our furnaces are just a, a digital, um, what amounts to a melting furnace. Um, and so there isn't a atmospheric control within the furnace. Um, some of your higher end furnaces, uh, especially for tool making, actually introduce um, whether it be nitrogen or argon, uh, there's different types of gases that can be used. But what it does is, is removes the oxygen from the furnace so that there isn't any uh, corrosion or oxidation that happens during the heat treating. Uh, ours is just a standard uh, electric furnace. So what we do is we encase this in a foil bag basically uh, so that it protects it from that, from basically from burning. Um, and it keeps the oxygen off the die and allows it to heat up to temperature and come to the hardness we need without it uh, oxidizing or getting any surface contamination. Um, it actually, if you don't do it, it will actually eat into the surface and disrupt the material itself um, and you won't get a nice clean finish. We're going to cut that uh, foil with just a standard pair of, of metal shears and we're just going to bend it by hand. Um, just caution to those who aren't familiar with stainless steel foil. This stuff is just like a sheet, it's like a blade. Um, so even after decades of doing this, I still end up with little nicks all over my fingers. Um, we'll see if we can uh, do it without any cuts on my fingers. It'll be like the, the old time woodworker shop on PBS, I don't know if you remember that show. Uh, the Wainwright shop, I think it was called. And we'd always do these tasks, <laughs> I'm like, by the end of the show, he always had like band-aids all over his fingers and that was, that was great TV. I remember that and it, was, it actually was, it was very inspirational and it was always nice to see craftsmen doing things the way they actually do it. Ah, see, look at that. Look at that, right away. I reached my hand into the box and cut my finger. That is so typical. So just pull a piece of this out and uh, no real math here, I just want to make sure I have enough, and you'll see here in a minute how I bend it up. I just want to make sure that I have enough to create some, some bends and some folds. So I want to make sure that I have enough there. I'm kind of just eyeballing here, I'm going to cut it perpendicular. And we'll try to put the rest of this way without cutting myself. Uh, if anybody is interested in uh, any of the type of supplies and stuff that we're using, please just leave us a comment in the uh, comment section um, and I'll try to get back to you and tell you where, you know, to locate some of this material. Um, you know, most of the 
standard supply houses are going to carry things like stainless steel wrap, things like McMaster and MSC and places like that. Okay, so I already know that I'm going to create this. this what we're basically what we're doing is is creating a bag, uh, a nice tight air seal bag. So what I'll do is I'll first create this this back seam. Um, and what I like to use is, is just a hard straight edge. Doesn't matter if you use a ruler or a piece of brass, whatever you have. And uh, I kind of eyeball it out there. Make sure these sides are parallel. It's kind of like uh, folding a, a paper airplane or something, right? You want to try and just get it as lined up as possible. And uh, just kind of peel this first edge. This is like once I get this first edge started, um, I'm okay to keep going. But I just like to get a nice, you know, a decent crease on that in order to, to start the folding process. And I'm just going to bend that over, give it a good push. Now these kits, uh, they usually come with a roller. I have found these to be just worthless. Um, I suspect they work fine, the company wouldn't send them if they didn't, uh, but my preference has been uh, to use this vise. I just have a standard shop vise. Really doesn't matter about the size. Um, obviously, if the jaws were bigger, uh, this would go faster, but it's, it's not necessary. But what I'm using it for is a crimping tool. Um, I could take this steel and I could just, and I've done this in the past when I don't have a vise available. You could take the ed, like the round edge of a screwdriver or a hammer or anything like that, and you can actually, while this is on the table, run it along this seam so that it seals that seam up real good. What I like is to use the shop vise uh, and just use it as a crimper. So I just, you know, leave a little bit open here and put it in there. And close the vise on it nice and tight. And this seems like overkill, but here in a second you'll see why the vise is a little more uh, useful than the, the screwdriver or hammer or something like that. Because when you get to these next places and you want to fold it again, because what we're trying to do is create an an airtight seal here. I know I keep saying it, but just think think bag, think airtight bag. So when I get that folded again, again, I just return to the... I usually do go for three. Three is a charm. And then crimp it again. Now we're going to do this back edge, and I just come in and give it a little push. And uh, here's where I like the vise better. If I'm going to be crimping this with my fingers, I can get kind of a crooked bend. When all this material starts folding, it starts getting really thick and heavy. Um, so what I like to do is I like to take the vise and give myself, you know, a quarter inch, however much I need to play. Kind of keep it as straight as possible. Close it up and then bend it over and roll it there. There's a good place for that screwdriver. And what that does is it, you can see it gives me a really nice crisp edge in order to create those next bends. And that's why I prefer to use the vise because it it's, gives you just that extra mechanical advantage to bend this. It is stainless steel. It is rather rigid. Um, so it is just nice to have that advantage of the device to you know, help you print this um, nice and clean. Uh, we like to keep it as clean as possible. Because um, it'll, fit, it'll fit in the furnace better. You'll know without all the folding and all the weird corners that, that you're getting a good airtight seal. And again, here I'll turn it this direction now. And so what I'll do is I'll line up, if you look, I'll just line up that folded edge with the vise close the vise and that gives me like perfect spot to fold it over. Stainless steel origami. And again, so you see the fold of that steel is getting thicker and thicker while the vise, the vise doesn't care. It's just going to crimp that closed. And that's why I prefer that to this plastic roller that, see even my one, yeah, I can bend that so easily. And one more time, or just you know, line it up in there. Okay. So before I put this in the bag, um, I want to make sure that I get it cleaned off. Um, Ron has been engraving on this, so there might be some uh, 
leftover fragments. Uh, there might you can see uh, some sharpie has been on there just to you know for visual for whatever reason. Uh, there could be grease. My fingerprints are all over it. Um, I, I don't need to get too crazy on this, but I do use uh, some acetone with a paper towel, and I just want to clean the dye off and try and get as much grease and dirt off of it uh, because all that stuff inside the bag will burn and potentially introduce some uh, elements that could mess with the surface of the dye. So I'm just gonna get, uh, get a little, get a little acetone everywhere. I see it. Get some dirt and some grease. We're just trying to get that off. There's actually some old timers that I've spoken with a lot about uh, steel hardening and things. And um, I haven't personally done this myself and I'd be interested to know if anybody has. Uh, perhaps you can leave a comment about that. Uh, but they'll actually introduce, um, they'll take like a, a, a fingerprint of oil and actually smear it in the bag. Um, I've heard people put in um, pieces of uh, cardboard. Um, anything that when it goes through the furnace, it heats up, smokes out, and actually it kills all the oxygen in the bag. They say it's a technique like we were saying earlier about the atmosphere and you can get rid of the oxygen. And so they'll use that, uh, like, a, like I said, like a smear of oil, it'll go through the furnace, it'll heat up, it'll cook, and it'll fill the bag, basically fill the bag with smoke. What you're doing is you're pushing out the oxygen. Um, I uh, have, have never found a need for that. Um, so whether it works or not, uh, I, don't, I don't know that. Um, it's just kind of a cool little thing that uh, I've heard suggested, um, but I have found no need for it myself personally. Okay, so I have this uh, bag prepared. You can see it's all crimped and nice, and I can pretty much count on that being uh, oxygen free enough. Uh, and we're going to take that guy and we're just going to make sure it goes down in there. And this is a, a very, a moment where you really want to be careful because this edge here is just razor sharp. So you really want to be careful. So what I'm after is I got that in the bag real good. Um, and I'm just going to crimp that and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back through and crimp that edge just like I did the back side and we're going to seal that in there. And there you go, nice and clean. Now you can actually buy stainless steel bags that are preformed, open-ended. Uh, it's just, honestly, the stainless steel is not cheap. Um, the bags, if you're only doing one or two um, and you've got it built into your margins, then I would suggest build, buying the stainless steel bags because there's obviously gonna be uh, less possibility of oxygen getting into your furnace or into your bag. Um, but considering the amount of steel that we harden and temper here, uh, the bags are not economical for us. So we buy it in this stainless steel sheet bowls. Okay, for O1 tool steel, you want to go from room temperature to 1200 degrees, no more than 400 degrees per hour. So you wanna go 400 degrees per hour up to 1200. So our room temperature is somewhere around 75 today. So we're going to go to 400, then we're going to go to 800, and then we're going to go to 1200. And each one of these is going to take one hour. And then O1 tool steel hardens somewhere around 1475 to 1500. Different brands have different temperatures. You can go by your manufacturer's suggested amount, but O1 tool steel, most tool steels by any designation maintain pretty consistent temperatures and molecular structure. So we're gonna actually aim, and this is a silly number, but I'm actually gonna aim for 1487 degrees. And I do this as a visual cue on my furnace. It's not mathematical by any means, the 1487. I do it so that when I come off the 1487, I can, you know, as I'm walking by the furnace, I can see that number. If it's not at 1487, I know that the, the cycle is either coming up or is complete, depending on the time that it's been in the furnace. So what I'm going to do then is at this point, I'm actually going to set the furnace to 1487, and I'm going to have it take 
30 minutes to get to that point. At 1487, you need the steel to sit at 30 minutes per first for the first inch and then 15 minutes for the additional inches. You always want to go by the widest section of the steel that you're hardening. I had a four inch piece of steel there, a four inch diameter steel. So for the first inch, I get 30 minutes. I got three more inches, so I'm gonna add another 45 minutes. That's gonna to come to an hour and 15 minutes. To make sure that I get full soak time, and this really depends on your furnace. Like if you're using a, a really high tech furnace, these you can be real mathematical about how long it's there. You can have it in there exactly one hour and 15 minutes and you'll know that that temperature has gotten through and through. We maybe have a little slop in our holding temperatures and things like that. So I'm actually gonna hold this thing for two hours in order to make sure that that dye has soaked at that 1487 for at least two hours so that I know through and through all the way to the center that it has taken on that temperature. Because at that temperature, the crystalline structure within the steel is actually reorganizing and hardening, creating a crystal structure that's harder than it currently is. So I'm gonna hold that temperature to 1487. I'm gonna hold that for two hours. And then at two hours, you said, I said I mentioned a, a visual cue. So at, 14, at, at the end of two hours, I actually set the, the furnace back down to 1475, which is kind of the bottom end of the hardening temperature. But what I don't want to do is take that temperature outside of the hardening temperature. Because what I'm looking for, and I'm going to hold that, uh, I'm going to have that head down to 1475 quickly, like in five minutes. And then I'm going to hold that for let's say an hour, because that gives me, I'm not actually gonna leave it in the furnace. This hour and five minutes right here is where I have to take the dye out and actually quench it before tempering. I actually have to get it out of the oven. And what this is doing is giving me a window to remove the dye from the furnace and giving me a visual cue on the temperature gauge that it's time to remove it. At the end of that, I'll, I'll actually have the, pre the furnace shut off. Um, I'll turn it off when I pull the die out. But if I, if by chance I forgot it, like I walked away and went home and forgot about a die in the oven, um, I know I'm not leaving the oven all night and potentially burning the building down. But. Uh, these segments brought to you by Red Bull, not because they're a sponsor, but because like Cookie Monster, without his cookies, he's just a monster. Okay, so I'm gonna set the temperatures on the furnace. Um, I actually converted this to digital. You can see some of the remnants of the uh, furnace back when it was manual, um, but I converted to a digital controller um, so that I control all those ramp times um, and I don't have to stand in front of the furnace uh, for the next eight to ten hours. Uh, the, this digital controller is going to take care of the whole thing. Um, if any of you are interested in what it takes to convert one of these over to this digital furnace, please send me a message. I have a whole parts list and I actually have a wiring schematic um, that tells you exactly how to convert one of these manual furnaces to digital and it's super useful. Um, already did the legwork, so just let me know and I'll get you a parts list and a schematic for the wiring. Okay, I'm gonna set this digital controller to the ramp and soak schedule that I just went over on the paper. Um, there's, it will hold your settings um, and I did a slightly smaller die last time. So the settings in there currently, although the temperature's right, the soak times aren't correct. So what I wanna do is make sure I get the, the soak times correct for the size of steel that we're hardening currently. This for 50 uh, is the start temperature. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is let it know to turn on. And that's what we're doing here in this cycle number one. Uh, it turns on and then it takes uh, one hour, the T for time, first time, takes 60 minutes to get to that first 400 degrees. Another 60 minutes to get to the 800 degrees another 60 minutes to get to the 1200 degrees. And then according to the schedule we just built, I wanna go 30 minutes to 1487. I wanna hold that 1487 for two hours. So I wanna go one, 
20. So for two hours, it will go to 1487. That's the soak portion. And then from 1487, take five minutes to go down to 1475. And again, this that five minutes, that's the, the optimum window to pull that out. And I'm just gonna leave that setting for an hour. Oops. In case I miss the window and I'm I'm get busy or go to lunch or space out. <laughs> and then from for that hour while it's sitting there, which is again my window to get the dye out, it's sitting at 1475. And then this final setting, negative 2121, that's an internal code to this specific manufacturer's digital controller to turn off. So you don't have to worry about that 121. You see it timed out, which is fine. I've got all the settings in there. I've got a start. I've got ramps and soaks. I've got the soak temperatures for hardening. I've got a window built in for me to pull out. And then I've got the negative 121, which is the shutoff mode. So from there, we've got this tool that we bagged up earlier. We're just gonna place it. Um, I try to keep in mind how I'm gonna get it out of there later. Um, you know, if I put it in there randomly, I don't want to struggle when it's red hot to get it out quickly. So I put it in there thoughtful of how I'm going to actually cut the bag open and get the dye out. I'm just going to close that up. This, we just hold this down until it says run. That will turn on. And you can see it'll immediately start going up. It's at 51. It will hit 400 one hour from now. So five and a half hours from now, we will be ready to pull this die out. I was asked to talk a little bit about different steel alloys. We're, we're talking about hardness and hardening steels today. And basically as an engraver, I like to use a W1. It's a water hardening steel. Carves really nice. And I like it because it's really easy to work with. You don't need the, the ramp up times like Tim was describing. You just heat it up to 1550, let it soak, and then quench it in water. Um, there's, you can do it cold, you can temper it later, you can freeze it, you can come back later and temper it. Whereas oil hardening, you need to temper it while it's still warm. So that's one of the reasons. It's just a lot easier to work with. And also as gallery men, when we did that project, we were trying to use the same kind of steel that they used back in 1792. And that would have been a, a simple water hardened steel probably. Um, yeah, they, there is mention of him quenching in water. So, uh, but they, made, they had to make their own steels back then. They did it by by carburizing mild, mild steel and then, and then chipping off the carburized uh, uh, steel and then, then hammer forging it into, into a usable die. Uh, well, we, we didn't go to that extent, but we did use W1, so kind of we could compare apples to apples when we're talking about steel hardness and, and so forth. Uh, today we're using more O1. Um, we're not trying to be historically accurate. We're just trying to, to create a, prod, uh, a product and use. Uh, so, so W1 is a is a really tough steel. It carves pretty easy. I like it, uh, and uh, it's fairly easy to work with. Uh, uh, the problem is, is it doesn't anneal, it doesn't anneal very easy. It takes a long, uh, like 48 hours or something to. To go through the annealing process, if you have to do that, whereas water hardening steel, you can you can pretty much just heat it up to what about 1350 and just just turn the furnace off and let it air cool down. Uh, so I, I don't get into D2 steels. I, I do not like carving it. Nobody likes to machine us, and, and really, there's nothing here that we they they may make our punch and dies out of D2 steel, but that's in another shop in Nevada. So uh, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm only using uh, uh, W1 and O1. Uh, and for those reasons, uh, W1's really easy to work with. 
01's a little tougher, so that's what we use around here for our pit dies. <laughs> for 01, the tempering, depending on the hardness that you're after, is somewhere between 350 and 400 degrees. Because of the temper variations in our oven, we kind of head towards the slightly larger end. They recommend one hour per inch, two hours minimum. But most manufacturers recommend four to six hours to be sure that you've heated it all the way through. So we're gonna do 400 degrees six hours okay so we're very close uh, to about to pull this out um, I can actually look at the temperatures on the machine we're in step number five 94 minutes out of 120 so we still have 26 minutes to go so in preparation of pulling the hardened piece out and quenching it. After quenching, we've got to get it right into tempering before it cools down. Uh, 01, you have to get into tempering without the piece getting below 125 degrees. So I'm going to, in preparation, set this furnace, which we use for tempering, has the same exact controller. We're going to set it for the soak that we just described in the tempering procedure. Okay, so, 50, that's just the start, it just turns it on. In two minutes, this temperature will climb to 400 degrees. It will stay at 400 degrees for 360 minutes to the same 400, that's that soak from 400 to 400. And then that's that internal code to shut the, the furnace off. Now, when it's inside this furnace, when it finishes, it just needs to cool to ambient temperature. So that's why we kind of get it in the furnace at the end of the day, uh, because we can set it in the tempering furnace, turn the tempering furnace on, this thing will turn on, it'll run for six hours to, at 400 degrees, and then it will shut off. And that way when we come in in the morning, uh, in this case it's only six hours, so it'll be cooled off by the time we get here and it'll be ready to run right outside of the oven. Okay, you can see uh, from here, this is what I was talking about earlier about the cue that it's finished. I could have set up a timer and done all of that and when the timer went off, I was ready to pull it out. And you can do that, I've used you know the timer on my phone or just a oven timer, that type of thing. But what I've done here, like I said earlier, is I, I went from 1487 to 1475. Now if I get distracted in the shop or even if my timer goes off and I'm busy, when I come back, I can see, I haven't dropped below hardening temper, uh, temperature, but I've given myself a visual cue here that I'm not at 1487 anymore, which means I'm fully through the cycle and I'm ready to go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to reach in there and I'm gonna grab that out. It's red hot through and through. I've gotta get it out. I've gotta cut that stainless steel bag open. Then I'm gonna pull that steel out of the stainless bag and I'm actually gonna quench it in this bucket. This bucket is full of mineral oil. Everybody's got a different recipe for what they use. I choose to use mineral oil. It comes recommended by a lot of different people, including myself, who's been using it that way for years. Um, it doesn't sour as quickly as uh, some of the other um, vegetable oils or some of the other oils that people are using. I get my mineral oil just, you can buy them in one gallon jugs from like Tractor Supply is where I get mine. Probably sell it on Amazon or something like that. Um, if need be. Okay, so I have to do it relatively quickly. You've really got to get, with, with O1, you've got to get it into the quench as quickly as possible. You really don't want any air time. Um, it can get really brittle and re weird really quick um, with O1 in particular. So we're going to try and do this just as quickly as possible. Um, it might get a little clunky and awkward, um, but we don't get multiple takes on this. Okay, there we go.
what's called the flash point, which is a, the temperature at which a material is flammable. Uh, on mineral oil, it's super high as well. So on some of the other oils that, that some people might be using, um, you know, you can buy specialty oils for this um, from supply stores that have super high flash points and made specifically. There's different variations for different kinds of steel. And again, we're not, this isn't rocket surgery, what we're doing here. We uh, can use some pretty standard methods and get the results we need for the type of tools we're making. I just keep it moving to keep the material from sitting in one spot and you know superheating the oil that's around it. You're really trying to dissipate that heat. I'd be interested to know about uh, you know other people's experiences regarding quenching and what they know about what's being introduced in the material and you know why oil and why why different methods are used on the W1 like Ron was talking about on the, uh, the water hardening we have a bucket of brine um, basically it's just water and then I buy uh, salt from the water softening tablets and you can just you know buy it at Walmart or you know your hardware store or whatever and uh, just dissolve that until it's completely uh, saturated till the salt won't dissolve anymore and then for the s7 that I use this is one of the reasons that I prefer the s7 is uh, it's actually an air hardening and oil hardening steel so real small pieces can be air hardened uh, and bigger pieces like to be oil hardened so it has this temperature zone uh, when you pull it out of the oven where it's not reacting. So there's this huge uh, window where I can pull it out of the oven, get the bag open. I can really, I don't have to be so rushed and so hurried to get it out of there and then get it into the oil because it's, it's actually an air hardening steel. So as soon as you pull it out of the oven, it starts quenching. Um, with a lot of air hardening steels, you do want forced air over it. You know, we have like little fans we can put on it and stuff like that. But uh, it's nice because, like I said, you don't have to worry about drastic temperature changes and things like that with the S7. You can pull it out, you can get it out of the bag, you can kind of mess with it. If you fumble a little bit, you're not stressing out, and you can get it, and then you can quench it in the oil. And also with the S7, um, I have found, uh, and people will argue this, but I have found it doesn't hurt it as bad if you miss the temperature in terms of tempering. Like I've accidentally left it in the quenching oil overnight and came in and it was room temperature and I still got it into the temper and I got the hardness I need. Never saw 50,000 strikes, never saw a collapse of the dye. So I just, I have found S7 to be super forgiving. So I can kind of feel through the rag here, the temperature. It's definitely, too hot to touch, but it's uh, it's cool enough for, for this rag, but too hot to touch. So I'm probably somewhere in the 150 to 160 range. And I'm gonna real quick uh, clean this up on the wire wheel while it's still hot, and then get it in the temper. So I took that and I just cleaned it up on the wire wheel real quick to see if I got anything. I have no discoloration, I got no messed up surfaces. I'm really happy with the, uh, the hardness. Still, uh, <laughs> I got super calloused hands. I've been doing this a long time. It's still super hot. Uh, so I know I'm still above that 125 degrees. You gotta imagine a good hot bathtub as much as you can take is about 110. So there's kind of a, you know, you kind of get a, a feel for that 125. You wanna stay above that. I got my tempering furnace set up. I'm just gonna open that up. I'm going to slip that in there like a pizza, right? So close that up and we're going to start that bad boy. And that'll ramp up to 400. It'll sit there for 600 degrees. We'll come in in the morning. That'll be a nice, uh, it'll be a dark straw color, which is what we're looking for. Maybe with some hints of some like bluing around the, the corners and the edges. Um, and then we'll know that we're good to go. We'll run a, you know, a, a quick 
visual off of it and run um, a hardened cutter over it to see if it's hard. Yes, we can run it through a hardness tester and things like that, but um, we've had such consistent results over the years, you kind of just, you know, get in the habit, get it into production. I got that nice dark straw color with some bluing on the edges, just like we want. Looks good, should work. Yeah, 